there for Sheffield United. Inside and outside he goes, that's a stunning goal! How on earth did he manage that? Extraordinary stuff! Well that's how to answer back, and then some! Hello again, welcome along to the official Sheffield United podcast that we like to call One of Our Own, where we speak to players past and present about their time at Bramall Lane. Today's guest played a pivotal part in Sheffield United's rise from League One to the Premier League and of course etched himself into club folklore with a certain goal at Hillsborough in 2017. It is none other than Mark Duffy. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Good Cheers. to see you. Keeping well? Yeah, very well. Very we'll talk well. about Macclesfield a little bit later on because you've had some success there. Yeah. Um, but I will start with the question that I always ask our guests. When you walk through the doors at Bramall Lane when you've played here, what feelings do you go through? Oh, it's, it's amazing, to be honest. And it's weird as well because I had them feelings when I wasn't a player here. When I'd come here and, and you know, as an opposition, and play it. It was a it was a special ground to play at, and I always wanted to play well here. Unfortunately, I, I always did play well here. I remember at one of the games at Scunthorpe, I, I scored a goal, and we were winning. And then I had to come off, but the crowd gave me a, a standing ovation and stuff. So it, it's always, you know, held that special feeling for me. Um, and obviously, to come back here always brings um, great memories. Take us back then to the start of your footballing journey. Grew up in. Merseyside, yeah. red or yeah. blue? Red. red. Red, always a red, always. family all reds? Always a red, yeah. And, and was the dream always to be a professional football like you know, yeah. a lot of young lads yeah, have that yeah. dream? Just, just as a young lad, probably like, like most, most young lads back then, it was you know just playing football on the streets till all hours and you know um, kids were allowed to roam the streets back then and stuff so yeah just always playing and then um, I ended up at Liverpool from 7 to 17. So I was just educated by them really and unfortunately didn't quite make the grade at Liverpool. Um, they were looking for more athletic players, um, six foot plus, it was the Gerard Hulier era. Right. Um, and I, obviously I, I didn't quite make, make that grade but it was a fantastic journey um, and one that you know gave me the tools to, to go on. Being a Liverpool fan and then getting taken on by them at such an early age must have been brilliant for you and for the family as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, everyone being a red, they were all you know absolutely buzzing. We used to get tickets and stuff to go to the game, so you'd only get two though. Um, it used to always be like a fifer who wanted that extra ticket. It would be my dad mostly, but you know, my uncles, my aunties would all want, want to come to games and stuff. And as I say, it was just a, a brilliant thing, but. What I would say on it as well, it, it, it's tough on on young lads because the expectation and stuff and obviously, you know, when I did get released it was real heartache for me. Um, you know, but you go through that seven to seventeen and you sort of have that family environment where you've been, you know, twice a week for mm -hmm. ten years and then all of a sudden to get that taken away from you it, it, it was it was tough to take. And do you as a result, lose your passion for the game when that rejection comes? Well, I didn't play for 18 months after it because, you know, I, had, I was embarrassed. I felt like I'd let people down. I felt like, I, you know, my mum and dad would take me all over the country to games and stuff. Um, and I was always, it was, it was Mark Duffy, Liverpool. Mm. It was, I was always associated with Liverpool. And then I remember going in and just speaking to him on a Thursday and it was like, I don't think you're really going to get the, the contract. And it was just like, Boom! My whole life had been tipped upside down, sort of. And for a for a sixteen year old boy, it was like, you know, I don't think any sixteen year old's ready for that. Um, thankfully, they're doing a lot more in today's game for younger players. But I remember looking back at it, you know, looking back at it now, thinking that that's just mental to be able to, to do that to a sixteen year old. But mm -hmm. everyone wants that dream of of playing and stuff, so. You know, I think you've got to take the rough with the smooth, but thankfully, as I say, you know, they are getting better at it. I'm right in thinking you worked as a scaffolder for a while. Yeah, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, so when I, when I went from getting released and I didn't want to play football no more because of the Arctic, I, I was going back to college, but there was a gap in between where, you know, I wasn't doing it, and my mum was like, you know, you're not just sitting in the house all day. You're like, <laughs> get, get out, and you need to be doing something. So one of my friends, um, their dad owned the scaffolding company, 
And he was like, look, come, come and, you know, do some labouring for us and help us. And I was only meant to be working, like, you know, I think it was like a two foot or two metres off the ground. So I was only, he had me up at all kinds <laughs> of places, you know what I mean? I was like, come home and I'd be, I was getting up at six in the morning, working until six at night. And then, um, yeah, I think I lasted about 12 weeks and then I realised it was for me. However, I would imagine getting a glimpse into the real world, if I yeah, can call it that, yeah. helps you, shapes you, doesn't it, to a point? Definitely, definitely, because, you know, as I say, I, that was the real world. I, I remember sitting there and looking at some of the, the men who was doing it there, scaffolding, and they were telling me stories about what had happened and they had been doing it for 20 years and if I could continue to do what they were doing, I would be earning, you know, good money and stuff like that. And I remember sitting there thinking, no, that, I, that's not for me, that. I don't want to be sitting there in 20 years' time doing the same thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, mm. but I, I genuinely had belief that I, I could play football and I, that's what I wanted to do. Although I had the heartache and stuff, um, it, it, it gave me a, a real eye-opener of, you know, the other, the other way it could go. So how did you get back in? So I was playing five-a-sides, like, on Thursday night and I was sort of at that age where it, they had, the, they had a young, young age slot between, say, 13 to 16, mm -hmm. and then it was a li the later lads that come on, like 17 to 21. So I was in the middle, so I used to play young, and then the older lads, if they didn't have a player, I would get picked for their, for their one. And my friend now, Lee Trundle, was in the older group, and he got me on his team and stuff, and he was like, why aren't you playing? And I was like, I don't want to play no more, I just enjoy doing this, and he was like, no. You're coming down to Wrexham with me. And he took me down to Wrexham. I signed for them for a, for a year, but if I'm truthfully honest, I still wasn't over the, the article of Liverpool yeah. and stuff, and I wasn't performing at the level. I look back at it and think, the ability was there and stuff, and I could still turn it on, on, on any given day in training, but I just didn't have that desire to do it at that time. And then from there, I just said to them, look, you know, I think it's best me leaving. I wanted to just play with my mates then. But mm. then I slowly started to get back into it because I went to non-league and started to enjoy it again. Was that Prescott Cables yeah, that we've heard so much about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I ended up with Prescott Cables and stuff. And then it was sort of like a really good group of players and they were all older players and they gave me good advice and was like, look, you, you've got something, um, you know, don't, don't waste it. But you need to concentrate and you know stop going out on on the booze. I, I think I just turned eighteen or something. <laughs> so um, all the, all them entrapments come. Yeah. Um, so I just started slowly building my career back up, and then uh, football is strange because you can go from the top right back down, and you can go from the bottom quickly up, mm. and that's thankfully what what happened. And you got picked up by Morecambe. I went to Southport first. Oh, Southport yeah. first, So right. I went to Southport, I was, was at Prescott for maybe four months, mm. and then w went to Southport in the conference. I was at Southport, I think, for a year, and then Morecambe then took me, and then jumped from Morecambe in League Two to the Championship in Scunthorpe. So that was a big leap then, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I remember I was in Nando's with my missus, still living in my mum's. Um, just, obviously, we were having food, and my agent rang me and was like, um, Morgan, I've just sold you. I was like, what? What do you mean? I was like, I've had no say in it. Where is Scunthorpe? I didn't even know. <laughs> and he went, yeah, well, look, they've, they've trebled your wages, so I, I just presumed you would say yeah. And I was like, oh, well, yeah. So then I had to move from my mum's back bedroom to living up in Scunthorpe on my own. I think I was like 21, 22. So it was, a, it was a, not only a big jump in, you know, obviously from League Two to the Championship, it was a big step for me to, to, to be going to living on my own mm -hmm. um, in an apartment in Scunthorpe. It was just like, I remember sitting there like two days in thinking, what's just happened there? <laughs> but again, that's what football does sometimes, you know. And were you playing on the wing then? Yeah, I was on, I was on the wing. I was an I was out-and-out winger. Um, that's what I remember you as before yeah, you came here. Yeah, I was an out-and-out winger. So looking back at it, I was like, the first person who really worked on my game was Nilly. Because he, he, he was the manager at right, Scunthorpe. Okay. He didn't sign me, but he got the job not long after it. Mm. And he said, look, you know, obviously you're a great winger and stuff like that, but 
there's times when we can't get you the ball and you know you're not effective in the game you need to develop your game a little bit more and come into little pockets of spaces and stuff and he would sit me down and talk me all through and you know work on my movements and my patterns and stuff like that and then I, I just found out like I was naturally good at coming inside um, so it, it just you know it was like another string to me bow really and as I say Nilly played a massive part in it so me and Nilly have always had a great relationship because you, you you'd had a few clubs by the time you yeah. got here. Yeah. Why why was that? Can you can you pinpoint why that was? Or was it because you were doing well and it just happened to be that clubs were picking you up, or did you find it difficult to stay in one place for a certain amount of time? Yeah. Well, obviously at Scunthorpe when I moved there, um, I played a lot of games and mm. um, we got relegated the last day of the season in the championship and we went down to League One and then we played and then Doncaster was getting promoted. Yeah. And they, they, Don, Doncaster took me, um, obviously from Scunthorpe, and I signed a three-year contract at Doncaster. But n not many people know that um, in that contract there was a clause that if we get relegated, it was like a 50% cut. And I was like, oh no, usually it's not it's not that that much. Mm. Um, they, but they said, well, it's got to be that, and we're not going to get relegated. But if it does, you can leave on a free. So we were like, okay, yeah, well, we're not going to get relegated, but unfortunately, we got relegated the last game of the season. Who was the manager then? Um, Paul Dickhoff. Right. So Paul Dickhoff was the manager. We went, we, we were like, I think the last day of the season, we went in the in relegation zone. Mm. Um, and we lost like the last 10 games and stuff. There was loads of stuff happening. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was crazy. But then obviously, that clause kicked in. Yeah. So then I, let, I, I had the opportunity. I always wanted to play as high as possible. So I had the opportunity to move to Birmingham. Went to Birmingham and then I ruptured my calf in the first year. So it didn't really work out there and um, went on loan to Burton, which was brilliant. You had a good time there, didn't you? Yeah, it was really good. Jimmy and everyone at the club was brilliant with me. Got my confidence back up and then obviously ended up at um, Sheffield. But I, was ne I nearly signed for Charlton because. What before you joined the United? Gaffer, the gaffer and nearly was going to Charlton. They phoned me and went, I think we're signing for Charlton. Do you want to come to Charlton? I was like, oh, it's miles away. Don't want to go to London and stuff like that. So then he went, give us a few days and stuff. We'll, we'll get a deal over to you. This was for Charlton. Yeah. And then about three days later, he rang me and was like, I've got something better for you. And I was like, go on then. Because this was nearly on the phone. And he went, Chef United. As in, and this was the third time. Um, I could have signed here because uh, I nearly signed from Scunthorpe and then when I Doncaster when I could leave I nearly signed again but this was the third time and I, I just got that unbelievable feeling in my belly and I was like yeah definitely definitely signing um, and nearly was just like okay come down and meet the gaffer um, and, but what three days earlier obviously he was talking about Charlton yeah. I drove down met Charlton Oh, you actually went to uh, Charlton? Yeah, right. but wasn't the gaffer there though? They wasn't there at the time, they were still ah, negotiating, okay. but I met like the chief exec. Yeah. And then obviously when, when this happened, I was just like delighted with it. So how did Chris Wilder sell this club to you? Did he need to really sell it to no, you? No, no, he didn't need to. As soon as, as soon as Nilly told me, he was like, look, he's coming, the gaffer's coming. The gaffer had had promotion after promotion. Yeah. His stock was rising constantly. And then the club itself, even though I didn't sign the previous two times, I always had that feeling of, oh, I, wish I, w I wish I would have signed it, just because the other times it didn't really work mm. out. Um, and then the third time came around and I was like, I'm definitely signing, no matter what. And it was like the best decision ever. And, and what about how the, uh, the vision was put to you at that time? What, what was the kind of message from, from Alan and Chris? Well, I was the first signing, weren't I? So <laughs> they said to me, you know, you will sign you and then others will follow. Right. And then, you know, um, and they did, and it, and it was great because you think that season we signed, signed Flecky, Jack O'Connell, um, Leon Clark, they brought Cootie back off the transfer window, yeah. Kieran Freeman, um, Laughs, there was Simon Moore, um, there was loads, do you know what I mean? And do, and do you know when you're looking around at players like that when they're signed, do you get a feeling that something's special is building here, you know, yeah. looking around at the quality in the squad, we can give this a right good go. That's what we thought pre-season, but after four games, we were well, looking I know, around the game I know, thinking, I was what's to going that. on here? <laughs> I was going to come <laughs> no. to that, yeah. But yeah, you do get that feeling, um, you know, obviously, 
you look around the team had just been promoted Flecky was one of the standout players Jack O'Connell who I knew anyway mm. he'd had a tough time at Brentford but he, he was a quality quality player Leon Clark he scored goals for fun in this in League One obviously we had Sharpie I'd played against Cootie in the past knew how good he was bash it mm. you know Simon Moore again was another quality player so you look around the dressing room and it wasn't um, a young group neither it was like it was like uh, a good age to have and it was like an experienced group of players who, who could really go on and yeah. do something really good. E- enough experience of the game but not too much in terms of players who were on the way down, they were still yeah, on the way up. Definitely, so you know, I remember we were playing pre-season, we looked around each other and we thought this is a good group of players, mm. um, but as I say we, we didn't start too well, even though the games itself hadn't been played like Bolton, we, we dominated Bolton, I think it was the opening day, but yeah. we got beat. Mill, uh, Millwall away, we dominated them and we got beaten. Jack gave away a stupid penalty, and I remember sitting on the coach thinking, What, what, what did you do that for? Like, he just threw his hand up, and he was like, I generally don't know. I don't, I don't know. Um, and then we got beat by somebody else. And then I think the game here with Northampton, um, we were losing 1 0, and, and the, it, was, it was like on the edge of like the crowd turning. Mm. And we obviously we ended up coming back and winning, and we changed formation and stuff like that, and it just went. Poof. We've heard the story a few times about I think the Millwall game where Chris yeah. stopped the bus, and I don't know who we sent off. It might have been Billy. I might, yeah, I might yeah. be wrong yeah. to go and get the, to go and get the beers on. <laughs> Was it? Yeah. yeah. Did that surprise you that he taken that approach? Um, and what did it do for morale? Yeah, no, on the no way not back? really, because the gaffer's a really good man manager. Mm. I mean, he, 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 he is really good at that and he could sense that t- the lads were gutted because we were, we were putting everything into the game, everything into training and we just didn't feel as if we were getting the rub of the green and stuff like that and he just come down and just said, look, you know, I, I, don't wanna, I don't want you to beat yourselves up too much, you know, you're performing well and um, we just need to stick together and, you know, it, it will turn. Um, but it, I'm not going to lie, it was a, a period where we were all looking at each other thinking, what's going on here? Like, we've been open to get him, you know, promotion. And I think we were like bottom, bottom of the league. And obviously at home, the game where Northampton scored straight away, we were like, wow. You know, and look, like any ground, if the team's not performing and yeah. you're bottom of the league, you deserve criticism. And you could feel the pressure was coming and the, the crowd was starting to turn a little bit. But then, you know, obviously, I think Sh- Sharpie scored and then James Wilson scored the winner. And we just we just went on and, and grew as a team and just got that confidence. And then once we once we tweaked the formation, we just well that that was crucial. And and to this day, I can't pin Alan Nil or Chris Wilder down as to who came up with it because obviously it got nationwide attention. The yeah. further on you went with it, and obviously got to the Premier League playing that way. Um, can you remember how it all came about yeah, when they decided I, right this is it we're going to a back three? I know, I know. Yeah, yeah go on. Definitely. <laughs> So what was happening was Cootie was unbelievable in training. He was like absolutely like dominating training sessions, but he was still on the transfer list. Mm. And it was getting to a point where we were losing games and we played, I think we played Walsall in the cup game and we were getting beat and Cootie came on at half time and the game changed. He put Cootie in, into the middle, put me as a 10 and put, because at the start of the season it was Flecky and Bash. Yeah in midfield, me on the right and Downey on the left. He put QT into the midfield, bash into the back and we just QT just dominated the game in midfield and it was just like he's gotta play. He has got to play. And then since that day he just played and then it slowly got more momentum because because we were having so much of the ball it was like okay teams are now just sitting back mm. and they're just making it a low block and making it difficult to play through. Well, what else can we what else can we do? Because it was sort of like the centre halves were passing the ball to the wing back and supporting from behind. Now nearly and stuff was like, well, what else can we do to disrupt their their, their line? So it was you know passes to the back lad, the passes to the wing back. If he goes inside to a uh, to Duff or whoever who was mm-hmm. in, in midfield, the wing back would follow his run, and then Jack would go on the out on the outside, and it, it's but that happened over us dominating games in League One. And it was sort of like a practice run for when we got to the championship. And when we got to the championship, it was like a fully oiled machine. And teams were just going, what is going on here? They just got like, 
you've got left wing backs coming into tens and we've got centre halves going on the outside and I remember we playing Ipswich and they were like I don't know what's going on it seems like you've got like 14 men on the pitch <laughs> but when people are saying that to you in the game it gives you that like that belief yeah I bet. like wow like went on to something good here. it was so unique wasn't it it was so unique and teams couldn't really suss it out because wherever they put bodies we just overload the other side so it would you know teams right backs would be going i've got three men on my side and then they'd shift the man over and try and you know stop us that side and then we just uh, overload the other side and it would just be about working one side and then if we were struggling we'd come back out and it would be cutie who had that diag obviously now you've got ollie yeah which probably took it to another level because his, his range of passings i wouldn't say much better than cutie's but it, he, it, it's more a lower trajectory mm. and it gets it there quicker um, but we would switch play quickly and then we'd overload the other side and then we had, we had kieran freeman who come come back as well and in the final third he, was, in with he goals. was just unbelievable yeah. like yeah he, i think he got like 15 16 goals that season mm. and majority of them were all tappings <laughs> like from inside the six yard box and it was just and they're the things that teams were going why is he there like but because we had so much possession and we dominated all them games we just we just was just a well-oiled machine. Follow the link in the description and use the code THEBLADES to get up to 70% off your NordVPN plan plus one additional month for free. And when it's working so well like that, it must be a delight to play in. And, and the way you've just said it out, I'm thinking, you know, in the course of a 90 minutes, is it, is it difficult to stay focused on where you should be when the centre-half is going out down one side? You're saying about being positionally aware when all that's going on around you is is there a level of intelligence that's required to make sure you're in the right place when when the trigger starts yeah definitely and i think that's what comes down to the training ground we would work on stuff you know nearly in the gaffer would mm. see the stuff now and go okay well you wasn't quite right there um we need we need to move you out of this pitch this situation um once jack plays it to end the end the goals and stuff we'd go to attack the other side but then quickly come back as that would happen jack would already be on the overlap so it was these sort of patterns of play that we'd worked on that it just comes second nature yeah. is that as soon as the ball would come into to jack ender would make the movements it would go to ender go to me and it would just be like clockwork and then if we couldn't attack one side we'd go back out to cutie or ollie and then it would be a switch to the other side and we would isolate and overload that side because as a football fan, it's easy to sit there in a stand and think, well, this is just all off the cuff. But yeah, no. actually, there's a lot of planning that oh. goes on behind the scenes to make sure you can execute these phases of play. Yeah, out definitely. There. And there would be, I, pl I played as a 10, but if people look back at my time here, yeah, I was never really in the 10. I was always on the wings. Mm. I was always isolating and overloading the wing, um, the fullbacks on either side. But there would be some games that they would say... Um, we don't need you there today but we've looked at the clips and stuff we need you making runs inside the fullback and center half to stretch them and then when you add different players into the mix when did he come in the first year when we we done it we had sharpie and clarky who were both wanting to be the goal scorer but then when did he come in did he would drop in the 10 as well so i could move out there isolate and overload on the wings but then I could also we could also get it into Diddy, who would drop into the ten. Mm. So it was just like it, I remember Diddy come in on trial, and like the first day, the ball came into me, he overed it, it led it through his legs, played a little one two, and like we slid someone in, and we, I just looked at him and thought, oh, I'm gonna love playing with him. And you did. And I did, yeah. And so did Sharpie, and so did everyone because his football intelligence was just like unbelievable. And where, where's your head at at this point? Are you enjoying the best football of your career with maybe the best group of lads that you've oh, yeah. been with as well? 100%, you know, the best group of players that you could ever wish for, you know, every single day on the training ground. It would be, you know, everyone was laughing and joking, but as soon as the boots were on, it was like no messing about, full throttle, big tackles, big headers, big races. And I remember the gaffer had to stop the session one time the ball dropped and I, it just went in slow motion and I, as I look, because I would never go in for the tackles obviously, <laughs> Jack and Flecky was just going in like that 
And I was just thinking, oh my God, this is just going to be like a mental tackle. And both of them just full throttle went in and the ball burst. And the gaffer stopped the session was like, look, lads, I absolutely love everything you do, but like, <laughs> you should, you should, like, this is going a little bit too overboard, do you know what I mean? Because no one would pull out. Mm. And what we found is that a lot of the new players, was, was when, when they would come, they would always say to us, like, your training's mental, like, how intense it is. And they would always get little niggles because of the intensity of the training. Um, and sometimes they couldn't, they couldn't live with how intense it was, do you know what I mean? And that's why, in my opinion, a lot of the players would struggle to fit into the system because of, one, the system and the asks of it, yeah. but two, the intensity of training. And it, it become like a running it come like a running joke that every, every every window that came available, they would try and replace me. Yeah. But, but they'd bring someone in for like competition and stuff, you know, it was like... So what, like Ricky, Ricky, Ricky Holmes, Holmes Carruthers, Carruthers um, Ben Woodburn, Kieran Dow, Dowell further Dowley. down the line. Yeah. So the, every, every window would come and the lads would be like, oh, who are we getting here to replace you this time? But I always seen it as a challenge. Yeah. I always seen it as a, as a brilliant challenge for me. I was like, okay, well, you can bring whoever you want in. And I know the system, I know how hard I work, um, and if I can learn off somebody who, who comes in, yeah, brilliant, because I, that's making me stronger. And it was an amazing season, really, considering how poorly it started, albeit only a handful of games that you didn't manage to win in, but to win the, win the league with 100 points, yeah. Northampton was, yeah, yeah. was Northampton the game where a promotion was secured, or I was that the 100 so, yeah. points, I forget now, because... It all gets a bit blurry, yeah, doesn't it? But Northampton was, was a significant game. one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that was the game. I think we we be secured it with. Yes. With Flecky. I That's think we right. went down again. I think we went down one 0 and then Clarkie scored and yeah. then Flecky scored and I just remember that when he scored, everyone was on the pitch and you know it was just brilliant. And then obviously after the game, we were all in the dressing room, and it was special for the gaffer because it was all his old club as well. Um, and then obviously the bus journey home as well was... And was there a bit of additional pressure? It's interesting you mentioned about Chris being a Blades fan. Do you as players feel a bit of added responsibility knowing that it's his club and when you're close to the finishing line and there's a job to be finished off, do you want to do it? Not, obviously you want yeah. to do it for yourselves, but do you want to do it for him as well, that little bit more? I, I felt that in the first four games though. Right. I, I felt that very early on because I was a lot older than... Well, I was a lot, I was a lot, yeah, a lot older than mm. a lot of the lads. Um, so I felt like I had a, a responsibility as well. There was a few of us like Sharpie and Bash and Coots and Clarkie who would, you know, but I felt that in the first four games when it weren't going too well. You know, I was thinking, you know, I need to book my levels even more because I, I don't want it, him to, to fail yeah. for the club that he supports. Because I just thought to myself in, in that position for Liverpool and I, I would give absolutely anything and everything to be successful and he he done that here and you know but as you say later on you do feel it and he feels it because he lets you know because he's he's an emotional person and um he, he want he just he wants to drive that club forward no matter what and he, he did he done it and it was it was an unbelievable time what was his biggest strength do you think as a manager his drive yeah his drive to succeed was just like unbelievable like he used to say to us, look, I'm on a journey to the Premier League. This is what he used to say, I'm on a journey to the Premier League and I'm going to take this club and if you want to come with me, jump on. But you've got to do what I tell you and you've got to work. Did you believe him? Did you believe yeah. he'd get there? I, I, you believe him because he says it with so much, so much conviction. You know, you'd look at him sometimes and you'd think, is he messing? You know what? But he, he wouldn't waver, do you know what I mean? And he'd, he'd look you in the eye and go, that's where we're going. I believe it. I'm going to bring play. If you don't do the job, I'm going to bring players in to, to do it. Um, and then once we got that momentum, it was like it was just like a steam train. And obviously, you went into the championship and you consolidated in 13th, I think. Yeah. To finish something like that. Was was that? How do you look back on that first season back in the championship? Because you come up on the crest yeah. of a wave, but the leap from League One to Championship is still quite a big one, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. But we we look back at it with disappointment really because we, we were like top for a little bit we were always in and around mm. top three um, but I just don't think we had the strength in depth at that time um, because as I said we, we sort of practiced our formation and everything in League One and mastered it 
So when we went into the championship, teams couldn't handle it. And but when we got a few niggles and injuries and certain players come off the team, the drop off at that time was a little bit a little bit too much mm. and the team couldn't handle it. Um, whereas if you look at the time when we got promoted, if you look at the strikers we had towards the end of the season, we had Sharpie, Clarkie, Gary Medin, Scotty Hogan, there was Diddy, um, there, there was me and the Ten Dowley, there was so many attacking options that when two of the players wasn't doing it, we could just change yeah. and bring another two on. Um, so for me, the first year was a brilliant learning curve for us, but it also gave us the belief that look, with a few more additions, we, we could do something really... And we mustn't forget about Paul Coots as well, who suffered that horrendous injury. Yeah, I think definitely. it was at Burton, wasn't it? Yeah, obviously Paul's a, a really good friend of yeah. mine still. And, you know, um, when that happened, it, it, was a, it was a massive blow for us because at that time, I genuinely believe he was probably the best holding midfielder in the championship. That there was nobody who could get near him. He was just like dominating games. He was like so physically strong, good on the ball, good in tight areas, you know, he was brilliant. So it had a massive effect because unfortunately the players who come in to replace him at that time just wasn't at his level mm. at that time. Um, and it, it, it just affected the whole team because the centre half used to just give it to him and then he would dictate play and find those passes and the diagonal balls. Um, yeah, it was it was sad for all of us really. Even when you seen him come back and we were doing pre-season, his leg wasn't quite right, do you know what I mean? It's only probably the last year or so he, he's probably got back yeah. to any, any level where he, he wishes to be. Who were you close to in that group? Oh, Anyone in particular? Um, so Jack, Lunny, um, Flecky, Cootsie, Clarky, Sharpie. All of them There's loads, yeah, there's <laughs> loads. But I used to travel in with Jack and Lunny. Um, Ollie Norwood was in our car school for a little bit. <laughs> Um, who else? Kieran Bryan was in there. So there was, there, yeah. So Jack and Lunny was like, oh, and Flecky. Yeah. But, um, and did you socialise out of here? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But what, well, I used to always stay over on the, the Friday night, um, the day before games in the Copthorn. Um, and it, at the start, it was like me, Jack, and maybe like one other or two others. But then towards the end, there was like 15 of us, 14 of us staying over and we all used to, well, the gaff used to love it because any new signer who would come in, it was straight away, he felt part of the group because it wasn't just like he was in the hotel on his own, he would be in there with like 10, 12 lads, all downstairs having food together, you know, watching the football, talking about stuff and he felt really part of the group straight away. So. Mm. Um, because I've been in the other situation where I've, I've went to a new club and you know you're, you're sitting in the, the hotel on your own, you're having the hotel food, and you just, you just get bored. Do you know what I mean? And you can only so many times you can go into the shopping centre and, <laughs> and, and and do certain things. Do you know what I mean? But so it, it was brilliant that we all used to stay there, and it's it, it's probably they're probably gutted now that it, obviously it's closed because that, all that stuff is is now yeah. gone. Uh, I want to ask you about Hillsborough. Yeah. Um, you know what's coming. I mean, that must just be right up there yeah. at the top of your list. But I gather you weren't you weren't in the starting eleven. Oh yeah. Which, for a game like that, must have been really difficult to swallow for you, yeah, first and foremost. Definitely, yeah. Because the build-up starts weeks out, and then you get into that final week, and then it's it's game mode, and yeah. knowing that you're not starting. How did you take that? It was tough because I'd started the majority of the games prior to that um, and I think we drew a game the week before and then obviously the build up started and the gaffer and Sharpie had a chat with everybody and was like look you know we need to be Harry every single day leading up to this told us how big the game was and all that and then he pulled me I think we were in for the full week and then he pulled me and was like um, I'm going to start proxy and I was fuming, I was fuming, but you can't let that show, do you know what I mean? Because one, Brooksy was, was brilliant. Yeah. And two, it would affect the whole group. But he, he also, he, I think he dropped Sharpie as well. So both of us were fuming. 
<laughs> job offers a few minutes. So Sharp is giving you the big speech all yeah. week about what it means and yeah. how you've got to be and he's not playing either. He's not playing, so that just shows, you know, the man that he is, um, you know, he would put the club before anything. Um, but obviously, look, we were both disappointed. Mm. Um, but then obviously, he told us early in the week, got over it, everyone saying, you know, training was nuts, as, as usual, high intensity, all that type of stuff. And then the drive up to the game, it was just carnage. There was just fans everywhere and, um, you know, getting into the ground. And I remember the gaffer, it still makes me laugh now because the Fleetwood physio, who obviously I was there a few years ago, was at, was the fleet, was the physio at Hillsborough. Right. And he said he knew before the game they were going to lose. And I said, why? And he said, because when you got in there, you just took over the whole hallway. But the gaffer had purposely said to us, go and stretch outside and foam roll and just just make them go round the other way. Wow. So when they come into the hallway of Hillsborough, it was only tight. And they, they had to come through to go through, through us. Yeah. But when they turned up dead around the corner, <laughs> You're all there. it was like Jack O'Connell and <laughs> everyone foam rolling and stretching. And they were like, we can't go that way. And they went round the other way. So they actually didn't go through. So a psychological, psychological win there. Yeah. Yeah. So I... And I didn't think nothing of it at the time. It was only when the physio at Fleetwood mm. mentioned it. And then obviously the game itself, we, we should have been well well out of sight. You know, we dominated the first half. Um, and then they scored right on half time, which was a bit like guttering. Um, but then we all went in, because everyone was just together at that group at, at that time. We all went in, gaffer cam was all down, and then we went back out. And we, again, we were dominating the game. And then he obviously he said to me, you're coming on. And as I've come on, they've scored. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what a substitution that is. <laughs> but I'm also thinking like, I, I'm gonna be, we're gonna be on the, we're gonna be under the cosh here for, for the next 25 minutes. But I was still fuming that I was sub. So when the ball's broken stuff, I remember the ball going over the top, Leon's played the ball, and usually in that position, I'm more of a, like an assist, assist there. Yeah. Usually I would get my head up and like look to slide the ball across the box for somebody, but I think because I was still fuming. So it was the anger. It was the anger. It was the rage that fueled you to take the Probably, shot. Probably, yeah. It was like I'm going to show him. He shouldn't have, he shouldn't have dropped me. <laughs> and I remember having the conversation with the gaffer, and he was laughing. He was like, "Well, maybe you should do it more." <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember obviously I've chopped inside a few, once and twice, and then once I've hit it, uh, it just went in slow motion. Everything was just slow motion, and I'm thinking to myself, "That's got a chance, that." And it just went past them, and then as it hit the net, it just—it was like someone just went Poof, with the noise, and I was just like, "Oh my God!" It was in, and obviously I went to run that way, and then I realised the fans were up there, so it was just—it was just an unbelievable feeling. Like you can't even explain it. The videos are amazing, aren't they? You know, for Blaze fans, they love it for for a couple of reasons. Yes, the magnitude of the goal, but the timing of the goal because they were singing the "If you don't bounce, yeah, blah yeah. blah blah." Yeah. And you literally just killed it. And that's why you've got the nickname Bounce Slayer yeah. and God yeah. knows what else from that day. But it, it's funny when you, and you'll have seen the videos. I when do fans bounce? Get lost. <laughs> fans bouncing up and down, and then you strike, and all of a sudden it goes whoop. It's, it's just crazy. Like, like I say, it just, it just kills everything. Do you know what I mean? And I genuinely believe that the clubs from that day just went opposite directions. Um, the, the magnitude of that game just swung the whole power shift of the city, in my, in my opinion, because mm. um, they just didn't recover from it, and we we just got stronger and stronger. I gather your dad's got the the co well, you'll have it as well. But I think yeah. your dad's got copies of the goals as well. Yeah, he? yeah. But I've got, I've got like can stick them on. all the copies and um, the goals. What I find weird as well is like most of the footage is from their fans. Yeah. I'd just delete it if that was me straight away. <laughs> yeah. I, I wouldn't have put that out there. There's no way. But thankfully they did. And um, yeah, so, but some of the footage, there's one from one, one of the angles where it's from quite far away and you see flares and everything going off and there's just bodies everywhere. It's just like, it's just mental. Is that the best you've ever scored then? Yeah. Best, best feeling. Best feeling by a million, million miles. Like, um, they're all unbelievable. You all get unbelievable feelings from all the goals, but obviously, um, you know the build-up to the game, mm. me not playing, the anger I had inside me. Um, obviously, as I said, the, the magnitude of the game—it just all bottled into one, and it just 
it's just unbelievable. And you're in folklore now, you know, I've, I've sat there with, with Michael Tong and other players who've scored in derbies, Michael Brown, they're in folklore. Mm. You know, not everybody gets the opportunity, A, to play in a Sheffield derby, which is a fabulous occasion yeah. in itself, but not everybody scores in one. No, def definitely not, and it's funny because, like, Clarky always goes to me all the time, I scored two that day, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, quite right. But, Obviously, his goal wasn't as good as mine. Yeah, and obviously that season ended in promotion to the Premier League, um, which was just ridiculous. Yeah. I was here, you'll not remember it because I think you were too drunk, but I did the yeah. end of season do, uh, and that was the night when John Egan got everybody up and did yeah, the song, yeah. and the celebrations were just ridiculous. I think you got lost at one point during the night, I don't Definitely. know, I can't remember, but yeah. you know, it just kind of brought it home just how close you all were, but it's one thing going from League One to the Championship, yeah. but Championship to Premier League yeah. is just off the scale, isn't it? It was, it was unbelievable, but as I said, that, that previous season had given us the belief, and then once we signed a few more players, mm. we added to the strength, the strength of the squad. Um, I would say the majority of the team was still the same, um, and then the firepower we, we had towards the back end of the season, you know, we would look in, into games where it was close games and it would just be like, you've got like three top, top championship strikers there on the bench who could come on at any given time and score a goal. So it just gave us a, a massive belief that we could go on and, and, and do, do something, something special. And, and you know, the, the ground would be packed every single week and, you know, the backing that they gave us, you, you, honestly, you'd walk out there and you would just feel unbeatable. You would, you would be going against teams and you'd look at it and they might have spent a fortune on players or they might have been international players but once, once we got them on that pitch we thought we, we could just run these ragged yeah. and that was the belief that was going through the whole team. Yeah, it's the Ipswich game when it was sealed wasn't it here which was just yeah. an incredible occasion. Yeah. Um, Jack O'Connell. Yeah, Jack O'Connell, that's the one. Daniel yeah. Manor did the commentary, he's a friend of mine. There's loads of yeah. like little ones where I look back at the time and think the commentary on that was brilliant. Yeah. Obviously, the bashing one. Oh, it yeah. leads. But yeah, yeah. It, it, again, it's, it's brilliant. So it's just like there's so many, you know, little side stories and twists and stuff to, to it. It's just, it, it's just, it was just a brilliant period. And the partying went on for some time because oh. Chris, Chris liked his, his ale and still yeah. does, and we still speak <laughs> regular. Um, but I, I love the story about Paul Coots at the snooker, who I think actually got ejected from the crucible for leaning yeah. over and taking a swig of one of the players' what, glasses of water. I think that was one story that did the yeah. rounds, and there's probably some that I can't repeat on here yeah. as well. Um, do you remember much about the I, celebrations? I, remember, I, I was like, I'm the worst drinker out of them all. <laughs> I was the worst. So I used to get like the banter, like I couldn't drink. So I could only do like one night, and then I would be dying for the next like three nights. Well, obviously, some of them could, <laughs> they could drink, and um, yeah, there was some partying going on. But I remember when we—I can't remember what game it was—and when the fans were carrying us off the bus, um, it was up outside here. The f when we were getting off the bus, there was thousands, and you couldn't get off, and they were all like <laughs> lashing you on. But we'd been drinking on the way, on the way back home, and. But as I say there was there was some partying going yeah. on. Um, there's pictures of steers in the cop tour. Oh, that is hilarious. With, with, that uh, is with, hilarious. With the alcohol and stuff. I mean, and let's go and get steam and is a phrase that's used around Sheffield now. I know, <laughs> and then someone done like a little um, a clip of us when we were in the manga and he's talking, and he's like, yeah, it's been a tough week, it's, you know, they're professional and all that, and then it, 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 cuts, it, to it, cuts, it cuts to him like <laughs> drinking and all that, and you're like, it's just brilliant. You know but it's funny, isn't it? Because, you know, every player paid their part, some more than others, and there's probably names that you forget along the way who actually were very important at certain periods of time along this journey. Of course, and, and look, the, the gaffer used to always say it's not, it's not about the 11, it's, it's about everybody, and mm. the lads who weren't really playing week in, week out, they were driving training sessions, like, they were wanting to get in the team, so they, they were performing well in training every single day, because they knew somewhere along that line they were going to be needed and they were going to be given an opportunity and you need to be ready for when you get that opportunity and try and take it because the gaffer would say if, if, if you come out the team mm. and someone takes your position and he comes in and he does well he's staying in the team so the lads who, who were in the team at that time was probably the driving force behind mm. all the success because you knew 
you, you couldn't rest on your laurels because someone was ready to take your place. So, it, 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 as I said, they, they, they were un, unsung heroes, but for everyone involved, they, they know how, how important he was. I have to ask you about how it ended, yeah. um, because you had so many good times yeah, here, yeah. and regrets on how that all yeah. came to a halt. What, what, what happened? What can no, you tell yeah. us? So, so de definitely, obviously, there's always regrets with it, do you know what I mean? And, and me and the gaffer, you know, we're, we're patched up with everything now, and we're on good terms and stuff. Um, but it, both of us agreed, look, you know, we could have done certain things differently. Um, I only had one year left on my contract and I wanted to go in and, and try and speak to the club and see if I could extend my contract mm. by, by a year. And, and that was it, really. And look, I, I think I caught the gaffer on, on a bad day. Um, but he's one of those people, the gaffer, is that once he's made a decision, he's very really he likes to go back on it. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm pretty stubborn myself, and you know I, I didn't really feel as if I had something to apologise for because I I just went in for a general chat with him and just to see if I could extend my contract. And, and it, it wasn't about you asking for no, no, more money or no, anything like I didn't that. Even because get to, didn't even get to know well, no, like no, that. true, but. Fans look at it in a certain light yeah. sometimes, don't they? they think, oh, he must have gone in there asking for more money, he's greedy, blah, blah, blah. I got thousands of messages saying the same, you know, yeah. you've done this yeah. and whatever. Wait, it was just, you know, I had one year left on my deal and I thought I could go in and speak to him and hopefully extend my contract by a year because everyone else had two and three years and I was just like, I'll just go in for a general chat and mm. see if I can. And it just escalated a little bit and then it was like, I'll leave it and let him calm down and stuff. And then, you know, I ended up training with the group that wasn't wanted and stuff. And I was like, that's not right. Like, you know, having me train with people like, you know, we were on the transfer list. Mm. And then I, again, I just left it. Carried on me training, thinking it would blow over, really. But it just didn't. And then, um, obviously, Stoke messaged the club and the club said, that, yeah, I could, I could go. So, um, it, it was heartbreaking for me after it. Because when I went to Stoke, I was like, this, this is not going to work. This is just not the same environment that I've just come from and the same group of people and stuff. Um, but it was the hardest part for me was the effect that I had on like, my friends and my family and, and stuff because they'd been on that journey with me. Yeah. And everybody was so excited to get to the Premier League and all that stuff. And no doubt you were ready to test yourself and course, excited about. Of course, and it probably hit them as much as it hit me, um, and I, I think I'm, you know, I'm pretty strong and stuff like that. But you look, know, there was times when I was lying in bed thinking, why did I go in and and, and speak to him? Do you know what I mean? That day, because at the end of the day, if I didn't go in and and, and speak to him on that day, it wouldn't have happened. Mm. But so you know, part of the blame lies with me, and that's something that I've got to live with for the rest of my life. But. You know, I, I, I've spoke to I say, I've spoke to the gaffer since, and I speak to him quite often and stuff. And if there's one thing that both of us wish we, we could turn back the time, it's probably it's that it's that day. But it's good that you've sorted it all out yeah, in the end, and you, and you get on because you should do because for each other, I thought you were great for one another, and I'm sure you would agree with that yeah, in terms definitely. of what you were able to give him and what he gave you. Of course, of you course, know. and that, that's the sad thing is that for me, a lot of people jump to the end. Yeah. of the story yeah. of what happened and they want to know what happened at the end and stuff and I'm like well there's so much good that happened and you know I could talk about the, all the good stuff for hours and, and, and days really do you know what I mean and as I say it, it's great that now you know we've, we've sorted everything out and it was just one of those things that happened and unfortunately it, it did happen and um, it, it was a learning curve for me You'll always be welcome down here. Don't worry about this lot. You'll always be welcome <laughs> down here. Almost out of time. And I'm going to yeah. fast forward to the present day. Macclesfield, yeah. congratulations, by the way. Yeah, thank uh, you. Promoted. Yeah. Uh, winning the league. Uh, yeah. Robbie Savage and his mates trying to build the club up again. Enjoying yourself? Brilliant. It, you know, they've done a fantastic job there. You know, they've, they've took a club. Obviously, they were in League Two, got kicked out the leagues and was in real financial difficulty. Um, and they've put a lot of money into the club, changed the whole setup of it. Um, and now it's a club that's you know going to be on the rise really over the next few years. They've, they've recruited a, a lot of good players, um, and as I say I think they won the league by 15 points. So um, all good things happening there, and, and both both of them, both Robs, um, they do an unbelievable job, and they're there all the time, working long hours, 
and they, they put so much hard work and effort into the club so um, when you do something like that it, only good things can happen because of the hard work that you put in so we're we looking out for mark duffy the manager one day coaching manager yeah definitely i'm doing my coaching badges now um finish my a license in the summer and then um who knows what happens well good luck with it and it's been brilliant to talk to you thanks so, cheers, so much for joining thank us you. thank, thank you very much cheers there you go ladies and gents the bounce slayer it's been great to spend an hour with him mark duffy and i hope you've enjoyed it and we will be back again soon on the one of our own podcast but until then we'll see you soon bye what a response from sheffield united and you talk about team goals but then you talk about individual quality this from duffy is absolutely brilliant just been introduced to the game turns Van Aken one way then the other, has no right to score there, it's absolutely no right but he's movement, he lays the ball off and then he goes, he gets in back behind Van Aken who's struggling to turn, he turns in one way then the other, what a finish.